Welcome back everyone to the final video here in section number two. This is the definite integral. In this video, I want to use the limit of finite sums to calculate out this thing called the definite integral. I'll give you a definition here in just a second. And we're going to identify how the definite integral relates to area under a curve, right? So the claim is that's the thing that we've been looking for, area under a curve for a while now. And we're going to get an exact way to calculate this out. So the idea being, right, if more rectangles are better, right, if more rectangles are good, then why not have a thousand or a hundred thousand or ideally even infinitely many rectangles? Then we would have such great accuracy that there really wouldn't be any difference at all. So our goal here is really infinitely many rectangles. And so in order to get started with this, in order to have infinitely many rectangles, we have to build up to this. So I'm going to start off with a good example here uh, that shows some of the challenges, right? So first we're going to use eight rectangles, and we're going to be using, again, right-hand sums to approximate the area under the curve, and we're not going to simplify anything. So our first step, as usual, is to figure out what is the width of each one of these rectangles going to be. So the width of the overall interval is three, right? Because you start at one over here, for instance, and then you end at four. So in total, you had to take three steps, right? One, two, three. And we want to break this up into eight pieces. So I'm going to split it in half and then in half again, and then each one of those in half one final time in order to break this up into eight pieces. And the question is, well, how wide is each one of these pieces? Well, you take the entire width three, so let's see here, the entire width three, and you divide that by eight pieces. So in this case, it's going to be three eighths. So let's verify that this actually works. So if I add three eighths to one, that's going to be, let's see, eight eighths. So plus three eighths, that's going to be 11 eighths altogether. And then if I add another three eighths, that's going to give me 14 eighths. And then another three eighths, that's going to be 17 eighths and then 20 eighths, and then 23 eighths, and then 26, and then 29, and then finally 32 eighths, and is 32 eighths the same as four? Absolutely. And so we can see that this formula seems to have worked. All right, so the last thing, in order to get this area, we're gonna do the width, so 3 eighths, times the function's value, and we're going to choose the right-hand endpoint. So on our first rectangle here, we have the left or the right-hand endpoint, so I'm going to choose the right-hand always. So this is going to be 11 eighths. So the height in this case is going to be the square root of 11 eighths, because again, our function here is the square root function. Okay, so that's our first rectangle. Our second rectangle, the square root of 14 eighths. Our third rectangle, the width times... Let's see, the height is going to be the square root of 17 eighths. <coughs> oh, my goodness, there they all are. So, yes, we have 3 eighths times the height of the rect fourth rectangle, fifth rectangle, sixth rectangle, seventh rectangle, eighth rectangle, right? And so there is our total area. Notice again that I'm not simplifying any of this because I want to be able to make the jump eventually to infinitely many rectangles. Our next step here is to really make the jump to n rectangles. So that's my goal here is to jump into n rectangles and then we can do a limit as n goes to infinity, right? We're quite good at limits. So I'm going to do n rectangles and I'm going to kind of jump back and forth and look at the differences between these things. So, okay, first of all, if I'm using n rectangles, just as before, I want to calculate out the width of each one of these rectangles. So the width, well, it's going to be the overall length. So in this case, it's 3, right? Again, from 1 to 4 is going to be 3. But instead of dividing by 8, because I had 8 rectangles before, I'm going to divide by n. So I'm going to do, again, this is 4 minus 1 divided by n, or this is really simplified down, 3 over n. So there's the width of each one of my rectangles. And now this is where it becomes a little bit complicated, right? Because I need to split up this number line, which starts at 1 and ends at 4, into n pieces. OK. And this is for the same reason that before, right? I split it up into 8 pieces, because I want 8 rectangles. 
Well, now this is kind of impossible to do without knowing what n is, but I'm going to try my best. So I'm just going to go ahead and split it up into a few pieces here, and then we're going to do dot, 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 kind of all the way to here. All right, so now I want to calculate out what are the x values for each one of these little tick marks. All right, so I'm starting at 1, and I moved over one of these delta x's, right, one of these widths of the rectangle. So this is really 1 plus 3 over n. For the same reason that before, this was 1 plus 3 eighths, right? So it was one of these widths of a rectangle. So 1 plus 3 eighths, that's what gave us the 11 eighths. But here, it's just going to be 1 plus whatever that width of the rectangle is. That's how far I moved, right? Because, again, this is our delta x value. So that's how far I moved. And then if I want to do another one of these, well, that's going to be two of these things, right? Because I'm going to do another delta x over. So this endpoint right here is going to be 1 plus 3 over n plus another 3 over n. So altogether, that's going to be 2 3 over n. So that's going to be the same thing as 6 over n. And then I'm going to move over again another delta x. So that's going to be 1 plus 9 over n. And so another way I want to write these is 1 plus 1 3 over n. This one's the same thing as 1 plus 2 3 over n's. And this is the same thing as 1 plus 3 3 over n's. And so on and so forth. So you can see that this kind of index is changing. 1 and then 2 and then 3. This is what we're going to be using in probably our sigma notation. You know, so 1 plus 2 plus 3, and we keep on going. And so all the way over here, for instance, this is going to be 1 plus, let's see, n minus 1, right? We broke this up into n pieces, n minus 1, 3 over n's. And then finally, this last piece, this 4 right here, so that's this one right here. So the 4 is going to be 1 plus n, 3 over n's. And is that the same thing? Well, yeah, the n's perfectly cancel, and you get 1 plus 3 is indeed equal to 4. So this is the same sort of steps that we took before up here, right? We got 32 over 8. We said, ah, that is the exact same thing as 4. So these are the same steps, but now it's more confusing, right? Because we have n rectangles rather than some specified number, like 8. So this is how we would do it with n rectangles. Okay, and the final thing is the area. So let's go ahead and calculate out this area here. Area is equal to, okay, our width, so that's going to be 3 over n, times our height. Remember, use, we're using a right-hand sum here. So this is going to be, here's our x value, this 1 plus 3 over n, and we're plugging this into our square root function. So this is going to be the square root of 1 plus 3 over n. And then the next rectangle, the width, still 3 over n. The height is going to be the square root of 1 plus 6 over n. Plus our next rectangle, width, 3 over n. The height is going to be the square root of 1 plus 9 over n. And we keep on going, right? Plus dot, 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 all the way down to the width of maybe our last rectangle here is going to be 3 over n, and then the height is going to be the square root of, again, we're using the right-hand endpoint, so we're going to be using 4 in this case, square root of 4. So now we have this all in terms of n's, and so we could let n go to infinity, right, because we know a lot about horizontal asymptotes or limits at infinity, and that would give us out the actual area. All right, so this was the complicated example. Let's go ahead and kind of take some of those lessons that we learned in this example and put them into kind of formal remarks and theorems. So let's go down here. The width of each rectangle is given by, and you had to take the overall width, right? So we had from 1 to 4. So if you have the interval, for instance, from A to B, then the overall width is going to be B minus A in the same way that 4 minus 1 gave us 3. And then we want to divide that by the n rectangles. So that's going to be the width of any given rectangle. And that's what we're going to call this delta x. Now we need an equation for the right-hand endpoint of kind of the ith rectangle. So the first, the second, the third, the fourth, all the way up to the nth rectangle. Right? We want to, get, we want to be able to write down what is the formula. Well, it's from whatever your starting point was. So in this case, a. Ours was 1. right? We did 1 plus. Right? And we did so many of those delta x's. 
So we did plus maybe I delta X's. So let me go back here really quick and kind of stare at where this comes from. So for instance, right here. So this was our A plus one delta X's. So again, our delta X, our width of a rectangle was three over N. So we had A plus one delta X. That was the right hand endpoint for our first rectangle. For our second rectangle, it was A, remember A is one in our case, plus two delta X's. Right, so here's our delta x, 3 over n. We have two of them because we want to move over 1, 2. So two delta x's. Next up, we have a plus 3 delta x's. So kind of, again, this would be the right-hand endpoint for our third rectangle. So if you want the right-hand endpoint for your ith rectangle, whether that be your first, your second, your third, notice that you're just plugging in first, second, third, right? One, two, three is what you're plugging in for I. So this is the right endpoint for whatever rectangle you want, whether it be the first, the second, whichever. Okay, so now finally it is time to define this thing, the definite integral. So if F is continuous on AB, then I would like to add together lots and lots of areas of rectangles. So each one of those rectangles is going to have a height of F of X sub I, Right, so that's the function's value at the uh, right-hand endpoint. So that's this x sub i right here. So that's the right-hand endpoint of each one of those rectangles. So that's the height times the width. So there's the area of one rectangle. We would like to add those together, all the rectangles. So from our first rectangle all the way to our nth rectangle, we want to add together all of those areas. And then finally, we want to have infinitely many rectangles. So once we have this answer, we would like to go ahead and let n go to infinity. And if we do that, again, the area is going to be so accurate, right, that it's going to be the actual area, right? There's going to be, it's not going to be off by anything. And this is what we call the definite integral. Now, in general, right, the definite integral gives net area. And that's to say, Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. So net area between the curve F and the X axis. And what does net area mean? Well, it means if the function is below the X axis, then the area is counted negatively. Again, because if the function is below the x-axis, then this is a negative value. So this area will be counted negatively. So that's what it means by net area, because usually you think of area as a positive number, right? But if it's below the x-axis, then the area is counted negatively. And that's why we call it a net area. So let's get a little practice using this, uh, using the notation here. And so I'd like to calculate out the definite integral from one to seven of f of x dx. Notice that these, the one and the seven, those are our a and our b values. That's, that's the limits. So I'd like to calculate, again, the definite integral or the net area for this function right here. So from one to seven. So let's go ahead. Uh, here is maybe my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So again, some of this area is going to be counted positively. If it's above the x-axis, then this area right here is counted positively. But if it's below the x-axis, then this is counted negatively. Now, luckily enough that these are all nice geometric shapes, right? So I can actually calculate this area without using that horrible definition, right? This limit of the, with the sigma notation, all that sort of stuff. Because again, this is nice geometric stuff. So let's go ahead and calculate this. So the area of this first triangle right here is going to be, let's, let me go ahead and write down my notation here, the integral from 1 to 7 of f of x dx, so this is our definite integral, is equal to 1 half the base times the height, so that's the area of the first triangle, and now the second bit, right, this is counted negatively, so I'm going to subtract away the area, and this looks to me to be half of a circle. So half of pi r squared. So it's half of pi. And the radius here, the radius looks like to me it's uh, 2. So 2 squared would be 4. 
And then finally, the area of this last triangle, that's going to be 1 half. The base is going to be 1. The height is going to be 1. And so in total, we have 1 minus 2 pi plus a half. That's a horrible half. There we go. <laughs> All right, and that would be my final answer. So the big thing here that this question is testing is do you understand this notion of net area, right? That you have to count some of it positively and some of it negatively. All right, so there is our first example. Our second example, let's actually use this definition. So I'd like to use the definition of the definite integral to evaluate out Right, this integral from 1 to 2 of x dx. And I went ahead and I gave us a picture here. And of course, there's a quicker way, right? This is, again, some nice geometric thing. If this is 1 right here and this is 2 right here, then we can go ahead and calculate out the area because it's a trapezoid, right? I can break this down into a rectangle and a triangle. And so this would be a slick way to evaluate or to verify our answer. So for instance, let's just do it really quick. Here's 1 and here's 2. And so this is going to be, let's see, area 1. This is going to be area 1 half. So all together, we should get the answer 3 halves. Great way to check our work here. But it wants to test, do we actually know the definition of the integral, right? The definition of this definite integral, this complicated thing that we brought up up here. We need to get practice using this. So let's actually use this, and hopefully we get out the answer 3 halves. If we don't, we've made a mistake. All right, so our first thing as usual is to calculate out delta x. So delta x in this case, well, that's going to be my b minus a over n, because again, we're using n rectangles here to get the actual area. And so, okay, b, that's going to be 2. a is going to be 1, so this is going to be 2 minus 1 over n. That's just going to be 1 over n. Next, let's go ahead and calculate out our x sub i's, right? Our x sub i's in this case, so these are all of our right-hand endpoints. This is supposed to be a plus i delta x's. So in our case, our a value is 1 plus i, right? This depends on i, and then delta x. So we calculated delta x was 1 over n. If you'd like to, you can go ahead and simplify this down, right? 1 plus i over n. N. All right, now let's go ahead and calculate out our sum, right? So we're going to be summing up lots and lots of areas so of our n rectangles, so from i equals 1 to n. And each rectangle has a height, that's f at our right endpoint, so the function's height at our right endpoint, times the width of the rectangle. So we have a height and we have a width. So this is going to be the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x sub i. Well, our function here is just the boring old x function, right? So everywhere we see an x, we would plug in x sub i. So this is going to be 1 plus i over n. Oops, forgot to write the 1. 1 plus i over n. So that's the function's height at our right-hand endpoint times delta x. So that's going to be 1 over n. And we're going to sum this up from i equals 1 to n. So let's go ahead and calculate really quick. Well, actually, I guess there's a few things going on here. Let's maybe go ahead and distribute this 1 over n to each piece. So i equals 1 to n of 1 over n plus i over n squared. And now there's this rule about the sums, right, that you can go ahead and split this up to each piece. So I'm going to sum up from i equals 1 to n of 1 over n plus sum up from i equals 1 to n of i over n squared. And notice i is the thing that's changing here. This 1 over n squared and this 1 over n, these are constant with respect to i. So I'm going to go ahead and factor these out, right? You're allowed to factor things out for any constants. So from i equals 1 to n, and this is just going to be now 1, plus 1 over n squared times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. And now these look like the rules that we had right from our last video. We know how to evaluate out summing up 1 from 1 to n and summing up i from i equals 1 to n. Right? We know how to exchange these. Right? We have rules for these things. So let's go ahead and exchange. So this is going to be 1 over n 
times, and if you add 1 to itself, n times, 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times, this is going to give us out n. And if we add 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus, right, all the way up until n, right, we just keep on exchanging. Uh, everywhere we see an i, we put a 1 and then a 2 and then a 3, right? We know that this is the same thing as n times n plus 1 over 2. Again, this was a rule that we got from our sigma notation video, our last video. So if you've forgotten this, go back, take a look at it, but this is where this comes from. Okay, and now we see that there's already a little bit of nice cancellation that's happening here. And one of these ends and one of these ends. Okay, very nice. And so our last thing to do, remember in our definition, right, if we want the best accuracy, we want infinitely many rectangles. So we're going to have these number of rectangles go to infinity. Okay, so that's our last step, and that's going to give us our definite integral. So our definite integral from 1 to 2 of our function x dx is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of these sums of rectangles. So and we calculated that this gets simplified down to 1 plus n plus 1 over 2n. And now, all things considered, this is a relatively nice limit to be taking. Let's go ahead and demonstrate our calculus knowledge on this one. So I'm going to do, 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 do 1 plus, and notice that the biggest power of n in the denominator is n to the first power. So I'm going to go ahead and divide through by 1 over n to the first power. And I'm going to do that in both the top and in the bottom. So now there's some nice cancellation that happens. And in the numerator here, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus, and if I was to distribute this, right, I would have 1 plus 1 over n, all divided by 2. And now as n gets very, very large, right, 1 over n is going to 0. And so my final answer is that this goes to 1 plus 1 half, which is, of course, the same thing as 3 halves, which was the answer that we proposed, right? 1 plus 1 half. That's exactly the answer we proposed, or a.k.a. 3 halves. So that's how we use this definition of the definite integral. Let's recap one last time. We found the width, and we found the right endpoints. Then we went ahead and we took those right endpoints and we plugged them into the function's value to get the function's height at those right-hand endpoints. Remember, we're using right-hand sums. So those were the heights. We plugged in the widths, and that gave us the area of a single rectangle. But we wanted to add together all of the rectangles, right? In this case, we were using n of them. So we added together n rectangles. So again, here was the height, and here was the width. And we were able to simplify this down, right, using these rules of the sigma notation to get something without sigmas in it. So this was our answer right here, and it didn't have any sigmas in it. All it had was n's. And now if we wanted the best accuracy possible, we should let n be very, very large. We should let it go to infinity, right? Again, we want 100 rectangles, 1,000 rectangles, a million rectangles, right? We want infinitely many rectangles so that we get the best accuracy. And so then we went ahead and took this, and we took the limit as n goes to infinity, the number of rectangles going to infinity. And when we evaluated out this infinite limit, right, which was something that we brought up in section 4 of chapter 3, right, we brought up infinite limits, we ended up with the answer of 3 halves, which was, right, in this particular problem, we could verify that answer. Right? There was a way to double check our work, but that will not be the case in every single problem. So this was really cool that we could double check our work in this case. All right, and with that, we can now calculate out area under a function or net area under the function with complete accuracy. I understand it's a bit of a pain. We'll be learning in future sections how to make this a little bit faster. All right, I'll see you then.